Hey, Guy, how are you? I'm very well. Um, I had a nice sunny run along the seafront to Dire Straits this morning. <laughs> Were you back in the 80s? Did, I was did you have a headband? I, I was going to say, no, I didn't have a headband. And neither did anyone else that I saw. <laughs> Do you know All what? These countless people who overtook me. It, it, so John, John Ilsley is on. He's got, he's got a new book out, which is, which is about his life in Dire Straits, obviously, because he's the only member to, uh, other than Mark Knopfler to have, have done the whole course. That's right. Years. He's there, Nick Mason. So, and it's extraordinary <laughs> how many records they sold, isn't it? I mean, I think it's something like a, a hundred and twenty million albums sold. Um, uh, Brothers in Arms was was the best selling album in the UK of the of the whole of the nineteen eighties. Sold thirty million. Well, it was million the birth records. of the CD, wasn't it? That's why it was the album that everyone had to buy to try out their CD player. But also, that that's the kind of music they got into in the end, wasn't it? It was. M- an incredible sort of soundscape arrangement that, I mean, you know, private investigations from the album before, Love Over Gold, it's seven minutes long. It's virtually all spoken. It's so complex. And yet Radio yeah. 1 play it happily. It goes to number two in, in the singles charts. You, but it must have been edited. It must have been an edit. But surely. you still couldn't imagine a track like that sort of, you know. What about Telegraph Road? That's 16 minutes. And it's a masterpiece, I have to say. I mean, this is yeah. the thing about about what they've left behind you know this is this but is also, some great work yeah the thing is that and, and they were knocking them out if you look those first four albums were like bosh 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 and they were knocking out the tours as well and i think john speaks a lot about is you know how hard it was being on the road endlessly i mean there were sort of musicians being sort of like left on the roadside as they went along <laughs> yeah, exactly well let's get him on welcome to the rock on tours Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London, they're brilliant. I know you're musicians, but you've been more professional than a lot of journalists. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah, that's it. Get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Hello. John. Hello. Bang on time. (laughs) Bang on time, just like a a bass player should be. (laughs) (laughs) That's our our role in life, to keep everybody in time. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, we met at Music for the Marsden. We did indeed, yes. Yeah, a great pleasure too. I, I've been following you for years. Oh, yeah. good Lord. Well, you'd be, you'd be in my top ten of bass players. Oh, my God. <laughs> John, wow. So he should be. I, but he's, he's, in my, he's in my top 11, John. The magic. <laughs> <laughs> all about the feel, as we know. Uh, what, Absolutely. What were you doing what, at all, Marsden? All, all those of us who didn't study say... <laughs> what were you? What were you? What were you doing? Was this before lockdown? Yeah. It was just. Before, it was dangerously close to lockdown. It was the last sort of big thing, wasn't it? Yeah. It was. And um, yeah. I was just performing with Nick, and yeah, we raised a million pounds for the Marsden. For Bernie Marsden. Bernie Marsden. Yeah, his book wasn't doing well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a little bit more important than that. It was. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a good. I, I think it nearly got uh, cancelled. Actually, I think it, at the last minute it was. It was pretty close to the edge. That one. Yeah, um, but it was, it was quite a lineup. I, I personally thought there were probably too many people on it. It felt a bit crowded to me. I know. I think it, you know a couple of people have had sort of you know a bit less would have been better. I think almost as many people who have been in dire straits in the entire history of the band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. where Which of going, course, where are we going with that then? <laughs> you, well, you, we, you, we were saying earlier how you know you managed. Well, you're the to... safe bet, yeah, because you're the one guy who you're the Nick Mason of dire straits, the guy who was there from beginning to end. Oh, that, well, that's that's that, that's very kind of you. Yes, well, I think just circumstances, you know, keeps you in the mix. I, I, I don't know. I mean. How do we know how these things work, apart from the fact that it keeps working and it works in a way that suits you and suits the other? And Mark and I are, you know, very close still. And um, despite all the stress and the strains of being on the road for many years and doing all that stuff, we we still remain very good friends. Because obviously Mark, you know, has a, a very strong artistic vision. And 
he wasn't scared to, you know, move people on and find new people if he felt they were the right. You know, I mean, the list of producers that are incredible producers that, you know, Jerry Wexler does one album and then, oh, no, we'll go yeah, with Jimmy Ivey. Jimmy Ivey. Yeah, yeah, right. and, and, and then actually I'll just do it myself. And and the same, you know, when Terry Williams was about to do drums on Love Over Gold and no, it wasn't quite working. Let's get Omar in. He stuck with you. Was there ever a feeling of, wow, you know, he might get rid of me at any minute? <laughs> well, it would have been difficult for him to get rid of me, actually, from a, from a structural point of view. But I think that pretty much from the word go, we as soon as I met him, I thought, I'm going to know you for a long time. You know, when you meet people, you just kind of immediately warm to them. And uh, I just loved his way of being. And he obviously liked the way that I was. And so we hung out a lot um, before we actually started the band. I mean, we just used to go up to the West End and hang out. And that's where Wild West End came from in the end, of course, but with us gazing dreamily into guitar shops in Denmark Street, thinking, uh, are we ever going to be able to afford one of those bloody guitars? I still I do that. that. I still do yeah, that. Yeah, but it was still, yeah. although you, or you've got them now. Because uh, <laughs> there, there was a lovely thing I saw you do with, with Mark about um, uh, but your sort of top six guitars. Yeah, and you yeah. went back to the Central Arcade in Newcastle exactly. where he got his first one. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right, for all of us, that's that thing that never, never goes away. No, I think there's still a fascination. I mean, suddenly if you go into a shop and you see a nice 58 Les Paul, you're going to sort of go, mm. I know. You know what I mean? It's, I or know. a nice 61 Jazz or something. But of course, you know, well, I know, I know. I mean, I, 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 what <laughs> shall I put behind me? And I, <laughs> I have actually dressed, my set dressing is for you. I know. Because I think you're a precision man. I just, for our listeners, I've got a Bill Nash precision and a 1960 actually Stacknov Jazz. Base, which was a wedding present from David Gilmore. Sixty, uh, yeah, mine's mine sixty-one, my jazz, and and the, the precision is fifty-nine. So I've got a year on you there, have I? Just just, just yeah. to give our listeners a little kind of clue as to what guitars can cost, you mentioned a nineteen fifty-nine Les Paul just then. Mm -hmm. uh, that will cost you anything from a quarter of a million pounds to half a million pounds, yeah. uh, depending on the flame of the wood. Yeah. I mean that, you know, I mean that's that's the the obviously the the uh the, the best there is but uh no ba ba bases are a bit cheaper surely guy uh they are this this is actually um the the stack knob jazz is probably the peak of collectability right. in terms of bases i have no idea what these things are worth because i because I, I have no intention of selling them and I, I for insurance purposes i just put some sort of vague number on them I, I, yeah. Because it's uh, you know if, if somebody really wants something they'll I mean like obviously the Russians are buying the fifty eight you know fifty eight Gibsons because they're any of the buggers who can afford them but uh, no musician would shell out half a million quid for a guitar well yeah that's right no, no. no that's right they, they sell them for that to, to, yeah. to bankers but I've got the same thing I've got my one absolutely beloved bass which is Betsy my sixty four jazz okay and uh, which has EMGs in it and whenever it comes to insure that. People say, oh, it should be this or this. And it's like, there's no point. No, there's... Because if it's gone, there isn't another one. Yeah, no. I mean, it's like your bass, you know John. I mean? there's, you your, know, there's, there's... your bass has played all around the world and some of the greatest stages of the world in mm. one of the greatest bands of all time. Yeah, it's it's provenance what that counts. But let's just, let's just get, go back. You know, you, you, you've you obviously been digging into your own history because your book's just come out. Um, yeah. But those early days of meeting... Um, of you becoming a bass player for a start and wanting to be a bass player, but then of of, of meeting Mark and how that all happened. Well, I, I don't know about uh, uh, um, Guy, but the, the, the bass players usually end up being guitarists who can't get into a band unless they play the bass. Yeah. Which yeah. is what exactly what happened to me. I wanted to join the school band and they had two guitarists in there already. One was, one was my brother. And I said, well, I'm desperate to join because I really just wanted to be in a band. I said, well, I'll play the bass. And they went, you haven't got a bass. And my brother said, I'll make you one in the woodwork shop, <laughs> which is what he did. And initially, I just took two, the two top strings off my acoustic and put a, a terrible pickup on it and just banged out some notes. And then suddenly, suddenly when he bought me, he built me this guitar, I suddenly felt that this was me. You know, I, I just it's like keyboard players. They they keyboard players are different from guitar players. I know keep keyboard players play guitar and, and guitar players play the keyboard, yeah. but saxophone players stand out as being saxophone players. And bass players just have a certain way of approaching the music. Uh and that's I felt that was 
where I fitted in best of all was there. I don't write on the bass. I write on the guitar and the piano, but in very modest ways, I have to say. But uh, it just felt right to me. And um, Wait, Have you still got that first bass? No, it was nicknamed the spade because it looked a bit like a spade. But I don't know what the hell ha- I, I, I wish I knew where it had gone, but... I then borrowed um, a Beatles, you know, the, the Paul McCartney bass, Hoffner. the Hofner very thing, oh, Hoffner violin, Hoffner violin bass, off off somebody who couldn't play it at school. His father had given him one as a present, and I said, "Can I borrow that?" So I had that really to play with, which was lovely. And uh, and you hadn't met. Where were you growing up? Because Mark was still in the northeast at that point, or was he studying English down down in 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 London? Yeah, he was he was an English teacher actually at Loughton College uh, when I first met him, and and he was in a band called. Uh, I think it was called the Cafe Racers. Uh, it was basically a rockabilly band, and he was just the guitar player in it. I say just the guitar player, but he was the guitar player. <laughs> uh, after we first met and started mucking about together on guitars in the flat, his council flat, um, his bass player uh, wife was having a baby and had to go off for a couple of gigs or something. And he said, will you fill in? Because I was playing in a three-piece at Goldsmiths College at the time. And um, so I started. I went and joined that. And... We were just sitting in a pub one night after one of the gigs and he, and we'd been playing a bit together. And he, I think he'd started, he'd cert- certainly written a few things which we'd played together in the flat. And he said, why don't we form a band? This is crazy. And, who's, and I said, who's going to sing? <laughs> and he said, well, I will. I said, okay. <laughs> so, was he writing then? Yes, he'd written Sultans, um, which was a band that he and David had seen, I think, about six months earlier in, down in Greenwich. Because uh, David was a social worker in in that area of London, and um, David David Mark's brother, yeah, yeah, David Noffley, yeah, and uh, I mean David was initially my flatmate, um, helped me pay the rent, which was a bit expensive, then nine pounds forty eight a week, which was unaffordable for a, a, a sort of student at Goldsmiths College. How did you lure Pick? I mean, he was a he was a sort of a proper musician. <laughs> yeah, he was. It didn't. He was even he playing. He was playing with David. Like the rest of us. <laughs> just, well, no, you know, I mean, it's, he'd he'd been doing it right. He had he had a CV and you know, he played with Dave Edmonds. Well, I I think you could probably say he was at that point the most professional of us all, but he still hadn't got any money. I mean, he'd been working for all sorts of people. <laughs> he was he was broke, and we had to pay him virtually to come down and play with to give him some petrol money and buy his tobacco. Buy his tobacco. Uh, unless he wouldn't, or he wouldn't come down. Let, let's get some cultural <laughs> cultural context, uh, John, because um, obviously this we're talking about nineteen seventy six, something or seventy five. When when seventy six, and I was just finishing my finals at Goldsmiths. I was doing sociology at Goldsmiths. So I was still a student, but uh, right, right. But sort of punks going on. But you guys seem to have your feet much more in the sort of pub rock scene that preceded. Uh, punk, which was obviously heavily influenced by country and blues, yeah. and had had this. There was this great DJ out there on Radio London who had this show called Honky Tonk called Charlie Gillett, and um, and I was in a band at that point in a band previous to Spandau Ballet, and we with a load of guys in double denim as well. And and Charlie was Charlie was the, <laughs> was the great Charlie was the great promoter of that. But but did you were you sort of ever thinking what was going on with punk was was that something you ever fancied doing or were you ignoring well of course everybody thought we were a punk band with a name like dire straits in fact ed bicknell said you sound like a shit punk band <laughs> <laughs> was our manager at the time he was always very kind about us but um, I, no, I, I, he tell ed to, well he's one of, also one of the great raconteurs of the music business it must be said oh my god i mean you know he said why why spoil a good story by the truth i mean he 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 would he could go on for a long time, Ed. I must say. Although his his actually said sorry. If I'm just, it, it, Ed was your manager as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Have you had him yeah, on? He big... Have you had Ed, Ed on? No, we haven't. We thought, but well, interesting because he he always says the reason he because he's such a huge Shad's fan, Shadows fan. Absolutely. Yeah. And he said the reason it was because Mark was playing a red strap is what sealed the deal for him managing you. Hank Mark. Hank I think, I think it might have had a bit more to do with the songs as well. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, no, it was a red strap. No, no, <laughs> don't let a good story. <laughs> well, he, he walked into the he walked into Dingwalls when we first met him in this ridiculous coat, which we called Lenny the Lion, because it was one of those horrible fur collars, and he had swept back blonde hair. And he looked ridiculous actually, and promptly knocked over the red strap on the bloody floor. <laughs> and he hadn't even spoken a word at that point. We thought. Who the hell is this coming into the dressing room? And and then Johnny Staines, the guy from Phonogram, said, "This is Ed. He's desperate to manage you." Oh. And then we said, "He's got off to a bloody good start by <laughs> kicking the <laughs> kicking the red strat on the floor." Because Ed's a drummer uh, as well, Ed, isn't he? And he played played yeah. drums with you sometimes. 
Well, he play, he did the stuff with the Notting Hill Billies with Mark. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. He's a good so, drummer. So sorry, we, we've, yeah, sorry we've digressed. We've so let's go here. back to yeah, the original question, which, which was, <laughs> no. which was, <laughs> no, he does that. Which no, was these? Very good at that. Yeah. Sorry, John. These two sort of pop cultural moments were happening in the mid 70s in 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 the same places actually in places like the Hope and Anchor and the Nashville and, and various pubs around London there was the pub rock scene which kind of was sort of led by Brinsley Schwartz and yeah. and then there was the punk Children scene on the high roads people like that yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. But, but your guy you were obviously really much more influenced by by American music and Americana is that am I right to say that yes I think that's probably true in a sense um well, you know, as being musicians, you pick up stuff from everywhere. But I, I think that um, the band had a style quite early on, which was uh, dictated by guitar playing, uh, without a doubt. And everything, everything uh, spawned off that. And uh, certainly a way of writing songs. And the punk thing, in a sense, it always felt to me like it was sort of somewhere over there. I mean, I know it was a very big deal for a few years, but... It had a, it had a remarkable effect on the music business. Briefly, gave it a good kick up the backside because which it needed at that point, I think. And I, I can't exactly remember why, but I think music was getting a bit sort of self satisfying. With you know, it was a bit wallowy and. Well, it was. There were basically. I mean, for some, for a kid like me, there were five bands, and you were either in one or you weren't, mm-hmm. and that was it. You know, that was there was there was no way in. There was no you know that was it was all so removed. Yes. So that was it was a whole thing of just making it people. Sorry, but guy, but then you ended up in one of those five bands. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't counted on that. Exactly. <laughs> and who would have known at the time? But they and um, well, yeah, quite. but you were you were probably in the right place at the right time, uh, and you and you and you made sense with what you did. So that's why people get into those sort of situations, don't they? But. The but you supported was, you supported um, uh, talking, talking Heads, heads. didn't you? Yeah, well, they were kind of sort of this sort of semi new wave arty sort of yeah. uh, difficult to put them into a category really because they had their own style. I mean, nobody sounded like them. So the build... well, it's interesting because we just had Chris France on, oh, and you? and it's interesting because because they yeah they weren't the same, they just sort of formed the the American new wave bands were a much more organic thing. They weren't trying to stand for anything or show anything. No. That that's just the sound they arrived at. Well, we were the, you know, we, we were right. the same uh, guy. To be yeah. honest, I mean that was the sound we had, and in a sense, it 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 dictated the sort of style of the music for for quite a while until we got into the making movies stuff, where things became a bit more open, and then Love of a Gold, obviously, and. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, but the first two albums were very much uh, about that dire straight style, uh, which was, I think, stood out. Which, which I must say is so strong. I've, it's been last few days I've been down a rabbit hole and revisiting them, and 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 especially even the first album, it's all there. Yeah. Everything's already, you know, it's fully formed yeah, that, and, and gorgeous it, and re- it sounds fantastic. Just that opening, now. It's aged the, so well. the opening eight bars of the very first album, and you've got mood, yeah. and you've got. You, yeah. it, you know the, that amazing guitar and then the rhythm when the band comes in which is so yeah. strong well i think that you know there's a significant part to parts to all that obviously you know mark's guitar playing and then you know when pick arrived i mean i'd played with a lot of drummers up until this point different bands soul bands jazz bands and all sorts of stuff and and as soon as pick and i sat down together it just was like Hang on a second. Have we played before? It was mm. one of those moments, you know, when you just lock in with somebody, mm-hmm. and that yeah, became yeah. that Love rhythm those. sound of the, you know, of the band for, for a long time until Pick left in, you know, after Love of a Gold. But, and to me, he, he you know, he's his drumming. For instance, I've, I've played with a lot of drummers now, and um, Pick's drumming on Sultans is, you know, without doubt, something extraordinary. Yeah. And you recorded that in that little tiny Pathway studio, didn't you? I mean, I know I looked it up on the internet because it says it's Pathway Studios, but yeah. we did our first demos there as Spandau Ballet. Well, and I remember, okay. I I remember this is in like Isling- in not where is it? It's in Newington Green near Islington. Yeah. It's an amazing. In fact, it's an amazing history. It's practically like it's like the Motown hip factory. The stuff that came. It's out. tiny. Elvis was there, there and um, I don't know. I think the police actually did some stuff there, didn't they? I can't remember. They did. A yeah. lot of people yeah, went yeah. through yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, but it was it was cheap, and you could get I think maximum three people in the control room to listen to anything. Uh, but you could work very quickly. I mean, we did five five tracks over the weekend, and 
that's all we could afford at the time. I mean, I don't know how many tracks did you do there when you when you went? Yeah, to... we did four in one day. I remember trying to get as much yeah. as we could done. But 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 there's a there was a great story at that time because when we were in there, obviously you'd already had a hit with uh, with Sultans. Yeah, and and the legend was that you'd recorded Sultans as the demo in 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 Pathway, and then you just could never reproduce the feel and what was yeah. so brilliant about that story is it it's not like anything you could get now because now everything is on a computer yeah. but it, that's it, right those there's, days, there's no such thing it was yeah. about the moment well it, it's interesting you say that because it was we were having difficulty um getting it better when we went to basing street you know sultans was that that particular take that, we, that came out of pathway a bit rough and ready and all the rest of it, but it had that feel to it. And in fact, actually, it was put out as a signal, a single for for a bit. And I've been I've been racking my brains trying to figure out how all those bits came together and when it was released as a single. And then and then the album version came out, and I just couldn't remember. So there are two versions. There was the. There, are you saying yeah, there's the there Basing versions. Street version, and then there's the old right, right? Yeah, the, the Basing Street version was, you know. Uh, was obviously much more polished in a way, but the, there was a sort of freshness about um, about the, the same guitar thing. parts. I mean, would you spot? Can you? I mean, how to, to, are, are all the guitar licks exactly the same? For example, I'd have to Sorry. analyse it. I'm not very good at analyzing. But you're up. But, but you're up. But there used to be such a thing, wasn't it? That um, which doesn't exist now because everything starts on a computer and it's just moved to another computer. Whatever that whole thing of it just doesn't sound like the demo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was such a that was you know it was always the great disappointment. <coughs> was, it was such a big deal to record something probably. Well, I'm still very old demo. fashioned. I, I I get my acoustic guitar and get my blokes around me and we 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 all play together in a room and try and keep it slightly separated. Yeah. Uh, because I always feel the first time that I play anything to them, what they do initially is i nearly always keep some of that so we play it and it gets yeah. recorded and then obviously you might dump the whole lot but nearly every time there's something that's worth salvaging from that very moment when they hear a new song and they just play around with the chords with the guitar or something and or the, or the piano and little things come out and that's sure. where i love that i live still love that bit of magic and i think that's really yes of course everybody goes onto the computer afterwards because it's you know, it's easier, basically. And you can do a lot of things with that. You know, it's a great tool if you use it in, 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 all, in all sorts of different ways you can use it. But I love that initial moment. I but still I, find that very exciting. But I imagine you set up as a band when you were doing those early albums. And, and Oh, yeah. We, in Basing Street, I mean, we'd done so many pub gigs, by, pub gigs by that time. We just literally set the band up in the big room at Basing Street. Do you remember? I said that's there? a lovely big room. Oh, it was it? fantastic. So, and it sounded yeah, yeah. great. And they said, "Well, boys, you know, we, we if, okay, you're playing live, but we've got to kind of, <laughs> we've got to separate it off a bit somehow." I remember, uh, yeah, I put, probably put this in the book, but Muff Winwood was very uh, gracious with us. He just let us get on with it. And um, yeah, there's only one thing he said to Pick was, "Could you just not play so, be so busy?" And Pick initially got, well, "What do you mean, play so busy?" We're not like protecting his area, and um, he was quite right. It just needed sort of. You know containing a bit and then because he said we can put some other stuff on afterwards of course which we didn't really know about at that time we we were we were kids in a new play a playground when we went to that studio yeah because you had muff winwood producing you didn't you steve winwood's brother who was yeah, who was in yeah. the spencer davis group i mean yeah. that's a name yeah. and then head honcho at cbs what yeah. was what was it like that, because obviously you're a writer you just spoke about being a writer i don't know whether you wrote then but was there a feeling well this is just who we're going to be. It's gonna, it's gonna be Mark writing the songs. There isn't. We're not. We're not like me chipping in or or someone else chipping in. Is is, is that how it worked, John? Uh, it's it's an interesting question because actually I wasn't I wasn't really writing that. But I didn't really start writing until after we'd done uh, Love Over Gold when I had, when we had a big break and I just you know I just I got, bought myself a piano, which I couldn't play. I had to teach myself how to play. And I and I started writing then. Um, at that particular moment in time, I figured, you know, he's producing some really wonderful uh, pieces of music, writing, I mean, lovely stories, ideas, and all the rest of it. And yeah, at that particular moment, I thought, well, I, there's not much point in messing about with this. I mean, 
somebody comes up with Romeo and Juliet and you think, well, I've got a song as well. And over here, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you, did, you didn't think maybe the kind of John Entwistle comedy number. <laughs> or the number. Ringo Starr comedy number. I mean, I, I do love the fact that some bands, I can't remember who they are now, but they, there's obviously the main writers in some pretty big bands and they, they share, share everything, which I think is rather gracious. But, you know, I was very happy playing my role. I mean, I mean, I, my role in the band was slightly different from Mark's. You know, I, I, I'm a bit better organised than he is, and uh, so I, you know, I was pretty pretty much doing all the the stuff that tour managers do and managers do. When we first started, I was handling all of that. Um, I and bet. Watching, and Did you have a fo- that's that's thankless stuff, John? Did you uh, have well, a following, John? <laughs> was there a big sort of pub rock following that that you know? Did you have? What would they be yes. called? The Dyers? The, 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 the you know, the, whatever. The, the Straits. The straights. <laughs> well, of course, then it would have been, yes. I mean, it's kind of an insult calling somebody straight, isn't it? Yeah, but exactly. I don't, I don't, you know, I think that initially when we first started playing, I mean, you, you go and play the Hope and Anchor and you get 20 people in one week. The next week you get 50 mm. and then it's kind of full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Yeah. Um, you know, in, in those days, we didn't have all the tools we've got now for getting the information out about where people are yeah. playing or how what they sound like. So people actually had to come and see you in order to... And so word was on the street. You know, people would phone people up, you know, the old phones and say, you've got to come and see this band or whatever. So very quickly, we were playing to, you know, quite a few people, which was, uh, you know, was wonderful. Well, sorry, just to flip back into the sort of... To, to, explaining a little bit about the kind of culture of uh, pub rock at the scene yeah. at the time yeah. uh, because I think the ultimate pub rock band name was the one that Mark played in before he played with you guys which was Brewer's Droop because <laughs> 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 obviously it was sort of p- real ale and pub rock were all sort of combined weren't they and Brewer's yeah. Droop is just the best name. I know I mean it's just a shocking name isn't it I, I think actually that's the first time that Mark met Pick because I think Pick did a couple of gigs with Brewer's Droop so I think that's how uh, right. uh, Pick ended up being in the band. Yes. So, but of course, your cir- the circuit though for you was the same as it was for ev- everyone. For like you know me and my little mod band, exactly. The, Gary and his post band were like the the Nashville, the Nashville, yeah, uh, yeah, and all those sort of yeah, yeah, the Nashville, you know, the King's Head in Islington. Uh, yeah. We we played the Albany Empire, you know, quite a bit down in Deptford because you know that's the only place we could get to play initially, but, and um, yeah, with Squeeze and such like. But there were there were. Places. I was going to say Squeeze because because that's kind of one of that that's the other South London band of the yeah. time, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, we played so. with them quite a bit actually. Um, that was the first time we ever played at the Albany. We were supported Squeeze. Uh-huh. But, but what's really annoying for all those other pub rock bands is Sultans of Swing comes out and it's a smash hit all well, over the world. <laughs> I mean, what does it go to number five in, in America or something? Is it? I don't know. What... Went to number four, actually. Just Did it, right. It's yeah. a huge, huge record. I mean, that. Yeah. how do you go from playing to 50 people in the open anchor to to that? Well, you, you, you're, you're suddenly in an ever-changing landscape, aren't you? I mean, you've probably experienced the same thing. You know, suddenly things start to happen and you, you, you've got a lot of things to put in place in order to deal with that success, if you like. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we didn't have any roadies when we first started. We were humping the damn stuff around. So, so suddenly you've got to get all those bits in place uh, but quite quickly. Thankfully, we we then got a tour manager, Paul Cummins, who's still a great friend of mine. And, uh, you know, he came into, into place and he'd been working with the heads in New York, actually, uh, and a few other people. So he suddenly took over a lot of that organisation. It was too much for me. Suddenly everything was really changing at such a speed. Mm. Yes, yeah, so and when we hit America, of course, in, in 78, for that first tour, where we did 50... 58 shows in 31 days or something crazy. <laughs> what? Yeah, two shows a day. We had up, we do, we're doing two shows a night. You must remember doing those oh, right. things. In those lovely no. clubs where everybody sits down and eats and then they'd throw one audience out and then get another one in. We had a lot to learn very quickly. Um, but uh, anyway, it, just, it really took off in the States. And I think that's what shook us really more than anything else. Because when you're driving, we were driving ourselves around. We had two roadies. And we were driving ourselves around in these hire cars. And every time you drove into a city, it was either breakfast in America 
on the radio or Salt to Swing, those two songs. Every single place you went to, <laughs> every university town, it was just playing everywhere. It was really quite overwhelming, to be honest. It was FM radio, wasn't it? FM radio, yeah. I mean, it, Well, also, yeah, the same saying over here, because I remember I worked in an office that, at that time and, and we had Capital Radio on yeah. and Salt and Swing was just on a loop. It was, it was just that. <laughs> yeah, everybody mad. <laughs> Yes, it's a funny. It's a funny thing. So, I mean, when we when we recorded it first of all, we just thought it was another song on the on the demo tape, and of course, giving it to Charlie, Charlie picked it off straight away. Charlie Gillett, yeah. Charlie Gillett picked it off straight away and and ran with it. And he said, "I'm going to play this song every single Sunday until somebody picks this band up." Well, it actually, but only two weeks went by. And so, <laughs> was, but what is amazing? I, sorry, guy. It's just so because. One assumes, looking back, that Sultans of Swing is like the obvious jump out, standout track from that first yeah. album. And, you know, the, but, but listening to that album, it's all so strong. There's like so many content, other things that frankly could have been that. But I guess it's there's something about the subject matter that made. Well, I that. think I think it it helped that you know Mark was an English teacher, so he was very good with language. And um, basically these that first album was his was his shared experience of of being in Newcastle you know coming down to London walking in the wild west end you know going to the gallery all that sort of stuff. now isn't that and sorry I just want to quickly because in the gallery weren't you with him wasn't that when you went to the Tate and saw I remember at the time the notorious pile of bricks <laughs> well actually it was just off <laughs> just off Charing Cross Road and all right. People had just started thinking that putting some string hanging from the ceiling and putting a pile of bricks in the corner was art, and because they called it art, which is fine, but it 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 didn't really do much. What, for gal him. what gallery did you say it was? I don't remember the I name thought, of the gallery. Uh, it was just that we actually went to visit. Uh, I think it was somebody called Melanie, who was a, a, an old friend of Mark's, who was actually the girl sitting in the gallery, <laughs> you know, running it, and we just went to say hello to her. And we walked in and. She was there and she said, so, I'm really sorry about the art, Chas. <laughs> this, is what I've, this is what I've got to look at all day long. But I think this was what was extraordinary. Yeah. About... But if you've got if you've got a spare hundred. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, this is what's extraordinary tricks. about uh, about <laughs> Mark's lyrics and what, what he was doing, what you were doing, is you were taking classic Americana music, which is about the sort of the white working class struggle, if you like, in country music. But putting that in the northeast of England is yeah. what he and and the two were almost identical. It worked. There, it, 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 there was no problem with that. But my question is, yeah. how did it feel for you guys first going to America, thinking we're going to get caught out here because we're sort of we're basically going to. There's so many more people doing this in America. You know, we might be a bit unique in the UK, but in in the states, it, it's it, you know we're just another country blues band, as it were. Well, I, I can tell you, I had a number of conversations with people in America. They thought we were an American band until we started speaking to them. They said, oh, gee, you guys are English. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, I think that storytelling is an interesting thing because that's really what we, we all do, don't we? we? We tell stories with our music and, and, and the feel of the music and with the, the, the idea of the music, the words. And I liken it often to... A painting, because a painting is is a is a form of reality, but done by somebody else, which changes reality into something else for somebody else to look at. And a song does the same thing. Uh, you know, you're painting a picture of reality. Uh, it's you know, okay, in simple terms, is I love you and I love you because and all the rest of it. But you know, we know about all that. But so if you're telling a story, you are changing, giving somebody a different kind of reality. And I think he was very good at that. Putting, you know, uh, painting that picture, for instance, on down to the waterline, you know, sweet surrender down by the quayside. Oh yeah, that's and great. Uh, I mean, people thought that was, you know, about um, seagulls on cue as soon as you said down <laughs> to the waterline. <laughs> He's uh, got a foot switch. You've got it all organised. <laughs> um, <the, laughs> just paints a picture, and you go, oh, you yeah, know, I remember that the first kisses, you know, and all of those first kisses, so sweet. But did those. you build confidence as players touring America? That that was communique written out of that. Yeah, we were written. Communique was we, was being written on the road. We were playing the songs of Communique on the road while on that first American tour before we actually recorded the album. That's because that's actually how a lot of people used to work, oh, isn't yeah. it? And that's something that sort of disappeared. That's how Pink Floyd used to work. Well, there wasn't any time oh, sometimes to to yeah. sit down and go, oh, okay, let's take a month off and write some songs or whatever. They were being written all the time, and so we were playing them. We we literally played 
the Communique album and the first album, you know, sim simultaneously before we recorded Communique. And but when you recorded Communique, that was that was in um, at Compass Point, wasn't Point, it? Yeah, yeah. Because most people go sort of pathway, Basing Street, maybe Air, maybe Abbey Road, and they sort of say, and then after three or four albums, sod it, we're going to Compass Point or Montserrat. <laughs> you just went straight there, album two. No. <laughs> Well, I think it came out of, um, I think it was Jerry's, uh, Jerry's idea. Jerry Wexler. Yeah, I think the heads that we recorded there as well, I think they'd mentioned it to us. Uh, oh, right, yes. They had... Well, they were there at the same time as Spandau, I believe. The, the, you the talking heads were there at the well. same time as us, yeah. but you were there in 78. Yeah, we did the true album there. But, but John, let's just have a little moment here just to talk, tell people who, who Jerry Wexler is, because he's, he's not just anybody, is he? Uh, no, <laughs> I mean you, you. You might as well. You could describe who, he, what kind of history this man had. Well, Jerry was uh, with Ertgen was the founder of Atlantic Records, uh, and he was when when we knew him, he was the uh, senior vice president of Warner Brothers. So he had some massive clout, and we were on Warner's in America. Uh, we'd signed with Warners in America because Philips, uh, not Philips, Phonogram was a bit weak in the States. And so we did a deal with with, with Jerry's company. And um, Jerry uh, said he wanted, he, he suddenly announced he wanted to re record the second album for us. It was a sort of wonderful compliment. And of course, he, he brought Barry Beckett from Muscle Shoals along with him and they made an extraordinary team. Barry was, uh, Barry was uh, part of the Swampers, of course, from Muscle Shoals. And in his own right, a wonderful uh, musician. And Jerry, of course, had history with Aretha Franklin and goodness knows. Uh, yeah, who yeah. Were... He invented the term rhythm and blues, didn't he? Exactly. Yeah. No, wow. Apparently so. Uh, anyway, but he was he was great to work with, but he wasn't going to slum it. So when we would, he said, let's do it. At Compass and, he, ah. and he rented this ridiculous house, which was owned by a, an oil heiress. Uh, and we were still living in a council flat. I mean, you know. Yeah. Hardly got any. We, we just about afford to buy some decent clothes by then. But so we went from Deptford to this mansion overlooking this blue Caribbean sea straight from southeast London. It was pretty weird, I've got to say. But I have to say, we got used to it quite quickly. <laughs> when we got there, of course, all the equipment that we'd hired from Miami, I don't know this is in the book, but it, we got this equipment from Miami sent down, which, which didn't arrive. And so when we got to the studio to start work, they said, oh, no, it hasn't come yet from Miami. So we, 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 well, we just borrowed some stuff from the local reggae band, you know, some old beat up bass amp and a speaker. And, and I think we had one Fender Twin Reverb we found somewhere. And all of the album was done on those two amplifiers. Really? Uh, that's, that's quite a testament. It's not bad, is it? You. Oh, not, but obviously... There's a lot of guitarists I can think of who <laughs> certainly would not function under those <laughs> conditions. No, no, well. Not looking at anyone. Uh, yeah, but... <laughs> no idea who you're talking about. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, but and and then on the third week, uh, there was a new girl on the desk, and we said, you know, that stuff's not arrived from Miami yet, has it? She said, yeah, it's down the bottom of the corridor. It's been here for three weeks. Why are you? <laughs> <laughs> What are you? Oh, for God's sake. I seem to remember Compass Point being quite like that. Yeah, yeah. It, well, that's the thing because that, there's this great image, isn't it, of Compass Point of, of being ultra glamorous and ultra. But the actual oh, no, nuts and bolts of the studio no, were um, yeah. The yeah, first when we first basic. got there, I think we had to change the speakers straight away because they sounded awful for some reason. You know, they'd just been overplayed. But when were you? When were you there, Gary? Oh, eighty, eighty-two. Uh, right. Yeah, eighty-two. Um, but was there a, was there a pressure on on you guys then a panic? I know I have had that as a writer before to <laughs> to come up with something that was as good as Sultans of Swing and 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 you know was like it but wasn't you know was was better. Oh, that's a, a kind of difficult question, really. I think I'd go, I'd step back a bit and, and 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 deal with the pressure we got from Warner Brothers to to put out Communique and record Communique while the first album was doing incredibly well in America. And it was still riding high and it has just started to take off in Europe. So suddenly we, we, we recorded this record with Jerry and it came out very quickly because um, I think Jerry wanted to try and, in his own words, uh, I want to try and recreate the sound and the feel of the first album. Okay, those are the songs we had and there wasn't a Sultan's of Swing on there, but 
the effect of the first album and the second album coming out together, right. almost together in some European countries was very confusing for people. And it was a, and we had to sort of, we, we tried to get them to put it back and leave it, but uh, Ed in the end had to sort of, you know, buckle down because of the power of the of the Warner Brothers uh, situation. And at one, so at one point we had, you know, Communique went straight to number one in Germany and, and knocked the first die straights off the top slot. So we had one and two. Gee. Which was completely. <sighs> How annoying. I think it's a really clever way of getting over the difficult second album. You just put the second album out really quickly while the other one's still doing well, you know. Well, I mean, in the end, in the end, it was fine, but it was, I, I felt, we all felt it was a bit rushed and we had, we, uh, you know, we had to play, to play catch up again with, um, with stuff, but, you know. So why? Because you were, you did bang out the first, yeah. I mean, the first four, it seems you, you banged out very quickly. <laughs> like the experiment. So what was banged it? them out. Oh. <laughs> Well, one can say that because they're fabulous records that have done incredibly yeah. well and have their place in history. So it's fine to say bang yeah. down. <laughs> but um, well, working with because uh, yeah, because what happened then? Working towards the next one, what was your feeling about that? Well, we had a bit more time, I think, after we finished the communicate tour, and we 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 don't, we we were either in the studio or we were touring. You know what it's like when you first start off, Gary. I mean, you you just non-stop. It's just mm. you think, you know, where. Well, is there any is there any time to go and you know go and sit by the seaside but there isn't any time and um but making movies was quite a departure for us and i think that jimmy ivy yeah here we go because we've got jimmy ivy yeah. right well um, he just the come off. headphone salesman <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean he was a he was a remarkable person to work with he was a very interesting man it, like somebody plugged him into the mains um, one of those and was guys. he chosen because of your love for Bruce Springsteen and and, and what he had done with the with, with because he did he did stuff with? Well, I get the feeling Jimmy Iovine tends to choose himself for things. Yes, we we liked what he'd done with uh, Tom Petty uh, and Heartbreakers, and also oh, he worked okay, with. Yeah. I think he worked with uh, Patty Smith as well. I'm he did. Sure. He did. Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, that. it was him who got uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen to give her. Yeah. Got, um, the unfinished uh, because That's of the night. night. Great, what so, a yeah. great song that was. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jimmy was kind of like on the up as well, and so uh, Mark went to meet him in New York, and uh, they got on very well, and they spoke the same language. So Jimmy was, in, uh, you know, after several keen negotiations between Ed and Jimmy to sign, try and get his fee organised. Um, uh, that went down. That was that was great, and it was great working with Shelley. Was a fantastic engineer, Shelley Yakers, amazing, a real stickler for sound. I mean, he made me change my bass strings about fifteen times to try and get a different kind of sound. In the end, we put the old ones back on again, which was really irritating. But oh my God, so you're at the power right. station now, weren't you? You you you, you didn't you now. didn't have Tony Bungiovi working as as yes he was there he was there oh great yeah. he's like a running character now because he's, <laughs> totally we've perfect. had john bon jovi yeah. on and we were talking and was john bon jovi sweeping up while you were there he was, he was there you yes he was there because yeah. he, he he talked about that and then at some point when he came in and i think he came in to get an album signed or something i can't remember what it was um, that's brilliant but he was, yeah, they, I think they were just starting Bon Jovi, weren't they? I, can't, I just don't remember too yeah, much about Yeah, them. yeah, but well, it's cause, cause yeah. Because Power Station was owned by, by John's cousin, Tony. His uncle. His uncle. Yeah, well, Sorry, but the, I mean, the Power Station, as you know, was a fabulous place to work. I mean, oh, it was, yeah, it was amazing. It was the epicenter. I was the, and it was the epicenter of the world, oh, it felt my like. my God, yeah. But you still, yeah. when you went home after, after dark, you still went in twos down that street. <laughs> yeah. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't wander around on your own. But, but um, we'll go on and talk about some of the so great songs on that album. But one something that happened obviously was was uh, Mark's brother David yeah. falling out, I guess, with 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 each other and David leaving. Was that where on, in the process of making this record did that happen, and how did that feel for you? Well, it, it happened quite early on, uh, if I'm memory serves me correct, because we were trying to we were doing Romeo and Juliet, and, and there was a sort of nice rhythm high rhythm part to be played and that was david's part and it wasn't very complicated but he just didn't seem to be able to get it together or had, wasn't practicing it or something you know how things come to a head i mean david had been really in a sense struggling with um the situation uh i think he found success quite difficult to deal with the, and he said he kept saying it wasn't supposed to be like this 
And I used to say, well, David, it is like this. I mean, mm. you know, the band is in this position now and you might not like it. You might want to go back to playing in pubs, but actually it, the whole thing has changed now. And, and, and so he was often very unhappy with the, the, what was going on. And I think the tensions between brothers is very difficult to sort of figure out. You have to sort of, sort of slightly read between the lines. And I think there was just a massive frustration that, that David wasn't really pulling his weight and, and, and I think wanted to make some kind of a point, but I never really got the point of it. He just didn't come into the studio and do the work. Mm. And it just, it just blew up one day. Brothers in bands, but, brothers in bands. Brothers in bands, oh. I know you. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. No well, yeah, this, it ran okay for me. I was rather lucky, but the history of yeah, it he's, isn't good. He's the exception. He's spoiled the fun for everyone. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Having a lovely relationship with it. it. it, it <laughs> it's difficult, you know, because, you know, I, I was friends with both of them. Mm. They were both my mates and I could see this thing happening. And I thought this is really unfortunate, but it is going to happen and it's going to happen pretty soon. So David stormed out of the studio after words were spoken to him and Mark. And I went back to David's hotel and I said, this can't carry on, man. I mean, you, we, this is just ruining the situation here. You, and, and he said, I think you've got a choice. You either come back to the studio and do the, do the work and get on with it or go home. And he said, I'm going home. Could, wow. could Mark be, or can he be, you know, quite critical and, uh, and, and a perfectionist in the studio? Do you think, is that part of the pressure? Um, perfectionist, yes. But uh, I think he deals with it quite well. I mean, he would, you know, we, You'd often, we'd often spend quite a bit of time working out what I was going to do after I decided what I was going to do. And, you know, we'd work on that together and he'd work on guitar, other guitar parts. And when we got to making movies, obviously, we, you know, it, we, with Roy Batan, I mean, they were working on keyboard parts together. So he was, I was going to say, what must because there's some beautiful stuff and it's lo that, that Springsteen cinematic. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, Roy, Roy plays in the E Street band, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, fabulous. Fab I mean, that was, that was, um, that was a that was a stroke from Jimmy. I mean, Jimmy brought that together. So that that really um, was an awakening for us. I mean, we knew we needed to get some keyboards on the on the. We didn't, but we didn't quite know who. And, and Jimmy got he just worked with Bruce obviously and and, and pulled, uh, uh, you know, and and and, and it's, it just it was a wonderful moment when he started playing on Tunnel of Love, for instance. It was like, oh, okay, wow. no, <laughs> okay. And did ha did Howlinders come in straight away? Did you audition or did what happened? Did did he play on the record or did uh, did Mark no, do the tracks? Uh, we brought Hal in uh, afterwards and for the Alan, tour. Alan, 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 Alan uh, Good. Apparently, I saw an interview with you from a Norwegian or something from from the time, and apparently, Mark said he he actually wanted two keyboard players. Yes. And was stopped. Well, but this is interesting. This shows that he wasn't completely the head honcho because yeah. someone said no. Well, I, I don't know if that was you. Ed probably. Ed Bignall probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I, I think that, um, yes, I mean, it, it might have been a throwaway comment, but in fact, actually, we ended up with two keyboard players, you know, shortly after that. We did, you know, when we got Tommy Mandel involved. Yeah. Because um, I, I know I know Mary Linders, ha ha Hal's uh, ex wife, uh, quite well. It, and I told her we were having you on, John, and she was. And I said, "Do you have any fond memories?" And she said, "Sitting, <laughs> sitting in a hotel room uh, with you guys and Bob Dylan, yeah. playing music and talking together." Yeah, that was pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Well, yes, I mean that that was after the Roxy gig in in L.A. You know, and uh, and Bob was in the in the cat in the bar at the top of the on the rocks. You know, you've played the Roxy, of course, haven't you? I, I never played the Roxy. Did you, Guy? I haven't played that, the Roxy. I don't, know if, no, I don't think I've played the Roxy. I thought Roxy, everybody had played the Roxy. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's just you. We, we went straight <laughs> to the arena, John. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, sorry, no, I forgot no. that. I forgot that. <laughs> no, no. But, um, yeah, well, Bob was in... I mean, in those days, Bob was in a very kind of approachable mood. He's less approachable now, I believe, because he's got getting a bit older. But he just came up to us and said, he said, that's some sound you got there, you know. And that was the start of the conversation. And and then after we you know we chatted for a bit, and Mark and he went off and talked about you know how to write songs and stuff. And then um, Bob came over and said, um, Are you st "You're all staying at the Sunset Marquee. Let's go back, and I'm going to play you some songs." I was like, wow. "What? Sorry. Okay, fine." <laughs> God, and what did he play? But of course, now everyone would have had their phones out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank God they didn't. I mean, he yeah, played. Yeah. He played for about an hour and a half, two hours in in the room. He, he actually played my guitar, which I had with me, and songs wow. that 
have never seen the light of day. He probably wrote... Is this what led to Mark producing him? I think that I think that that from that gig uh, he was interested in having certainly having Pick and Mark along. Yeah, yeah. The, a, a private audience with uh, with Bob was rather lovely, and then we bumped into him again in Melbourne a few years later when he was with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Yeah, he joined yeah. us stage there. Uh, yeah, he, I mean he, he and Mark sort of hit it off. I think they had a similar kind of approach to life. And um, well, you can hear Dylan's influence in Mark's stuff, can't you? In, in yeah, I, in I songwriting. Think, yeah. Well, I don't. I think that you, if you can go through life as a musician and not be influenced by Bob Dylan, you'd be very, you'd yeah. be a very unusual person. I mean, he. When I was talking about sort of painting a picture for people, you know, is the sort of with a song like a painting. I mean, I would, I would see him as the Picasso of music, Bob, because sure. sometimes you'd write things so abstract and so strange that people would go, "What is he talking about here?" And of course, he would just say, well, that word rhymes with that word and that leave it at that. But, you know, he paints a very sort of odd picture from time to time, Bob, I must yeah. say. Well, the whole thing is to be able to adapt your own story to it. Isn't exactly it? That's right. What great music exactly does. right. Yeah. How did you get on, John, with the with, with I mean, obviously, your band were a live band and and touring was your thing at this point. This is pre MTV as well. And exactly how right. did it how did it work for you and whatever family you had or you were? beginning to find at that time or was it just the band were your family well you know probably well you both know that when you're in a band you're in a, fa a different kind of family than the family you've got at home mm -hmm. that's how it works isn't it mm -hmm. um i think it was easier when you're young it's easier when you're young well I, you know i had a a wife and you know baby and stuff like that so that was very very difficult and um Unfortunately, you know, they became casualties of what well, the marriage became a casualty of mm. all that work. And, and I think it's 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 incredibly difficult. Uh, and not I don't think many people realize, um, OK, you're out there having an awful lot of fun and you're doing what you love doing. But there's sometimes there's a price to pay for it. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. that's very difficult. I found that really hard. And yeah. I think a lot of people do find it hard. There's not many marriages can you know, can last a sort of 15 years of, 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 of madness, really. Because as you, because you were so successful, your touring schedule was so long okay. and that, that, that it was, you also had to play, make the next record. So there really wasn't any time for a holiday, was there? No, there wasn't. Any. I mean, for instance, I mean, you know, we were talking about, you know, writing on the road. Well, you know, when we were, we were when we were doing the making movies tours, we were preparing songs like, um, private investigations and uh, Telegraph Road in the sound checks. Okay, that's amazing. I'm looking at Telegraph Road, which is epic. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, this is like yeah. proper Pink Floyd level. 14 you know, minutes long, minutes. 16 minutes long. 16, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It yeah. got longer sometimes. <laughs> the, the opening track. Yeah, the long ones do. It's the long ones that do. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, t it's telling a story, you see. I mean, it's... Uh, it's uh, there's, the, there's a road called Telegraph Road in, in um, uh, Detroit, isn't it? That's where it, I think that's where the idea came from. But I mean, it, the, lyrically, I think it's a, it's an incredible piece of work. You know, it's yeah, it's the thing. it's the tale of of, of one guy in, sort yeah. of inventing America, really. But it could easily be transported into the northeast of England as well, and and yeah. working men and how and how and how in a way that dream. Uh, gets taken away from you, and I, I love the way there's that moment in the middle eight where it's sort of what's well, middle eight, middle section somewhere, where it just becomes down. Middle eight it's just, minutes. It's just the guy. It's just it's the guy and a girl in a car. Exactly. And, you know, and she's not in, and it's not working out as well as it was, and the dream has burst. Yes, a bit of sort of stark reality. Yes, it, I mean, I think this is where the. Um, I'm not going to use the word genius at all because I think Mark would hate that, but. This is where the, the power of writing becomes very significant. And, and one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because he is never going to blow his own trumpet. He's far too modest for that. He just does his work, gets on with it, doesn't do many interviews, doesn't talk about what he does. And I thought this is going to give me a chance to actually, you know, talk about him in a way that he would never talk about himself. And you know, being around somebody like that, for me, was an incredible joy. You know, but the first time he played Romeo and Juliet to me on on, on the on National Steel was he came around to my house in South London and said, I've got something I think that might work. And he played it and I said, 
that might work. <laughs> is that the word you're using? Uh, uh. That is just beautiful. I mean, really incredibly uh. beautiful. And I, and I think I've got a little cassette tape of it somewhere, but I can't find it. <laughs> oh, no. no. I was, I was, did you do that whole thing we all did in the 80s of like not bothering to label it? Like, I'll oh, remember yeah. that one. It's the TDK. Oh, terrible. <laughs> I mean, we've got drawers full of stuff. And of course, nobody's got a cassette tape anymore. So. I got one because I was going to go through my cassettes yeah. and didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the point of all this is, you know, it, it's me actually. I, I, I want to, at this particular moment in my life, just reflecting on all that, I just wanted to celebrate not just him, but all the other musicians we played with who were just, I mean, can you imagine as a bass player playing with Hacking, uh, you know? Omar. Omar and, uh, and yeah, Jeff yeah, Bacara. Yeah. I mean, for God's sake. I yeah, mean, yeah. I've played with Jeff. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. Uh, it's, but, a, it's a dream, isn't it? I mean, it's like, whoa. It is. You but know. obviously that's at the next stage where it, it feels less like a band at that point. It, you probably, you know, with, with, with as Pick leaves, etc. But just wanted to, to, to talk a little bit more about that album, Love Over Gold, because... Uh, yeah, you know, you, how does it? How does the record company take that on board? You're a big, you're a big band. You've had Romeo and Juliet, and <laughs> yeah. Tunnel of Love, and, and 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 then you say, but even Romeo and Juliet as a single, it, like you were saying, you know, that's long. But then yeah. you turn around, and you say the first track's going to be some whatever it is, fourteen, sixteen minutes long. The second track is seven minutes long. Oh, and there's no singing on it. There's talking, and that's the single. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the the license that you guys had. Yeah, have you got, have in you got a way, it's, it's so 80s, isn't it, to be able to do that? Because there was much more power in the hands of bands in those days. It felt like the record company were more, more and more just standing back and becoming you know, involved in the marketing of this product. But yeah. such confidence to do that. Well, um, you know, when the record company first heard it, they, they said, this is, this is an incredible record. And, and oh. uh, uh, I don't think they were even thinking about a single because the band really wasn't a singles band as such songs yeah. were taken off to promote records that's what they did mm -hmm. and they and they and they kind of don't do that now because people just put singles out all the time or whatever they do either they make albums but no but anyway mm -hmm. it's, it's and i think that in those days they were prepared to nurture um the band because they'd already had by that time they had three very the band had, had three very successful records and in fact love of a gold remarkably uh went to number one pretty much everywhere apart from a few places in some ways, that that confirmed that mm -hmm. you know they were right in liking the record, and and uh, we were kind of right in doing what we were doing. And in fact, actually, um, uh, Private Investigations I think got to number two in the UK charts, which yeah. is pretty extraordinary. Partly due yeah. to Dave Lee Travis playing it on Radio Two, and he got ticked off for it. <laughs> now, I remember but hearing I, I, that. I remember being obsessed with that track when it came out. And what really was the drama, the film noir quality of it, the cinematic yeah, yeah, yeah. oral landscape that you guys yeah. had created. I mean, I was so taken in by the arrangement. And and it, this wasn't just the barroom band anymore, was it? This was, no. this was a band making stuff so grown up. Well, it's a wonderful opportunity, you know, when, you, when you've got material to, to work with like that, to play around. We, we, we played around with these songs a lot before we put them down. Uh, I can tell you, Telegraph Road on the Road, we, we, when we were doing it in the rehearsals, you know, there was a lot of time spent piecing it all together. It was like a massive jigsaw puzzle. You know, you, we kind of knew the first bit, and then the second bit came, and then, oh, okay, the third bit. And so we put it all together like a, like a jigsaw puzzle. And okay, well, this is where that word comes up. I think it's almost, dare we say it, prog. Prog! <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely art prog. There was definitely a sense of that. Progressive. Yeah, yeah progressive. Well, yes, I mean, I, in some ways you can call it what you like it, but it's just what you kind of yeah. do. I mean, yeah. I, I, I can't describe it in any other way. And, um, and, and then, uh, sadly, Pick decided to leave after that record because he... I think he found touring really exhausting because we were doing a lot of work touring. He just found it too exhausting. Mm -hmm. He got married. I think he wanted to have children and stuff like that. And he, I don't know. He, yeah. he, he said he said something really weird, which is like, if, you know, if I'm going to carry on playing music, I'd rather play with Weather Report. Right. And Ed Big will say, well, there's not much chance of that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but, Look, you know, I really, I really was sad when <laughs> Pick left because I. So then you get an Omar Hakim. 
But I love from weather. I love playing. Like, <laughs> I love playing with Pig. I mean, we just we just we just did what we did so naturally, you know. And uh, but anyway, then Omar came and did the Brothers and Arms. But, but didn't Terry Williams start that album? Because it was just just so Terry is because Terry Terry became your drummer. But Terry, I saw at the Roundhouse in the sort of early seventies playing with the Welsh band Man. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he yeah. was he was that guy, but he, didn't he go in and then you sort of he started playing that album when you were when you first started doing um, yeah, Brothers in Arms. I mean, I mean we'll get there, Montserrat, and and you went and and Mark went, sorry, you know, it's not working out. Well, it I I, I in Terry's defence, I mean he he was he was a better live drummer. Uh, I mean, he was an incredible live drummer, and I, you know, I absolutely adored playing with Terry. And he plays those toms at the beginning of. Uh, <laughs> yes, of God uh, knows of, how he worked that one out, but I think he hit everything. Of money for um, nothing. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so we kept that on, but it, it was there was a sort of weird thing happened. We were using this digital tape, which you probably, I think, it was the first time anybody had used this Sony digital tape. Oh, the Sony, yeah. yeah. And. Um, Terry was not comfortable in the studio. It was it was it was quite difficult to get the feel right on some of the songs, despite the fact that we'd rehearsed them before. When he got in the studio, he, it's no disrespect to Terry at all, um, but he just he just felt a little nervous. He probably thought the expectation that was expected of him was it was too much for him to bear. And ironically, one morning we go in and Neil Dorsman, who was engineering and re, and co-producing the album, he said something terrible has happened to you know we've lost half the drum tracks on 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 the digital tape and this was just before we were to fly home for christmas and uh from from uh from montserrat we had to make a decision and so when we came back in the new year omar was was free and he came over and did all the tracks in three days right bang wow. bang bang I mean, he was we, remarkable he was remarkable we should talk a little bit about oh god i bet about I bet. montserrat should we <laughs> what, the Air Studios, George Martin's famous studios under the volcano. Yeah, weren't you doing that? Weren't the police there at the same time? Well, uh, Sting was there, but he was on holiday. They uh, they'd recorded there, right. and the Stones recorded there, and I think uh, Phil uh, Phil from Genesis had recorded there as well. I think mm. Eric had done some work there. He had, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm. Yes, it was. I mean, it was a well-known retreat, and of course. There were no distractions there at all, apart from Andy's bar, which we used to go to afterwards um, and wake him up and make him open the bar up at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> there were no other distractions there. And, and for the first six weeks, it didn't stop raining. So there really you couldn't really go outside. So we got quite a lot of work done, apart from the drum tracks falling apart. But, um, and is that why, where, why Sting ended up on, on, uh, on Money for Nothing? Money for Nothing. Yes, well, he, 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 was, he came up for supper one night um and i think that i think and mark you know if, if you listen to the track there's obviously you know don't stand so close to me i want my mtv kind of thing yeah 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 and i think he he said mark said to somebody i wish it would be great if sting was here you know so we could say, and then somebody said well he's on the island he's on holiday on the island so we invited him up for supper and took him into the control room and said listen to this you, you know and he said bloody hell that's good he said um and mark said Do you want to sing on it so he said yeah so hang on, was was the idea of using the "Don't Stand So Close" line Mark's original yeah. idea? That wasn't something yeah, yeah. Sting came up it, with. You know, he was on MTV. What a funny specific thing! Sting yeah. was on there going, "I want my MTV," which of course, I mean, you know, that's that's and so that that was it. And of course, yeah. and what's interesting is that that became you're saying for being sort of an album band who kind of had these singles you put out as a shop window, whatever, and then you released one of the absolute defining yeah. videos. Yeah, it was the, the first age. video to be played on MTV yeah. UK, wasn't it? The, the very first moment it went to air. I think it was, yes, because, of course, they just they just moved MTV over to Europe. All that stuff comes together, you know, it, like the sort of synchronicity using a, one of uh, Sting's words. Um, Which is recorded at Montserrat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you've got DVD coming out, you've got digital tape, you've got MTV coming, and you've got computer graphics. It's all happening at the same time. It was a, it was a momentous amount of stuff coming together at one particular point. And um, Philips, of course, which had then bought Phonogram, Philips was our record company, and they were they were developing the CD and stuff. So I mean, and so that, that all came together. So the, but yes, you said yourself before haven't you that you that, that it was actually the advent of the cd was probably one of the things behind the frankly insane success of brothers yeah. in arms which is yeah. it was 
because everyone had just got a CD player and this was the perfect thing. This yeah. was everyone's first yeah, CD. It, was, it, it, it did go completely mental, actually. I mean, I mean, you just look back on these things and you see and you think, God, I mean, that was pretty weird, really. I mean, pretty extraordinary. At the time, it just felt, hmm, that's, that's convenient. They've just done some new technology and, oh, Philips are developing that and they own our record company and, oh, Sting's on the, on the, <laughs> on the, on the track. And so all those things come together and, you know, you just have to sort of uh, kind of live yeah. with it and enjoy it. Funny enough, talking about, we're talking about Phillips, because I remember coming to see you at Earl's Court when uh, and a friend of mine was playing in the band. In fact, Danny Cummings was playing percussion. Oh, right. Yeah. And, um, but, and your sponsorship on that was one of the great misfires of all that technology, which was the Phillips digital cassette. Yes. <laughs> Do you remember, which was one of the great non starters of all that, was the absolute beta max of. Yes, <laughs> you can't, get it, you can't get it right every time, can you? I mean, no, I know, no, no, no. I'm not blaming you. It was nothing to do with no, you. No, not at all. But yeah. money, money for nothing was a piece of genius, really, was it? That track, because because you you've got yeah. all of us bowing down to this great new god, which is MTV, which is going to sort of be the pipeline to, around the globe to sell us Absolutely. all. Yeah, and yeah. and and Mark writes a song. You guys come up with a song, which is very ironic. You know, a, a little yeah, well, dig, they, if you like, exactly. at the whole sort of new medium. And it becomes the biggest video on MTV. The irony is yeah. incredible. I know, but of course, it, the, the Americans, God bless them, didn't get the irony, did they? <laughs> so they, they, they put it on heavy rotation in the States. Um, but you know, it there again, this, that, this is just a, a case of amazing observation. The Mark and Sis set up house in... New York with Lords, his wife, and you know, it was just he went into a, a shop to go and buy some white goods, and 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 the TVs all had MTV on with Michael Jackson playing all the rest of it, and he, and he just listened to all these guys working in the store, and he just wrote down what they said, which is that ain't working. I don't even know what's, what's that. You know, <laughs> playing on the MTV, you know. Yeah, that, that that's point. the way you do it. And just, and there he is in the background, sneaking yeah. all the putting on and all the words. Yeah. And, Genius. And, and, and um, funnily enough, I bumped into uh, Ricky Wilson from the uh, Kaiser Chiefs the other day at, a, oh, at, lovely, at, a, at an event just around the corner from us. I don't know what, what he was doing there, but anyway, he was a bit off his track. But he came up to me and he said, he said, I just have to tell you, he said, we've been going, we've been, our band's been going on stage to the, to the opening uh, bars of Money for Nothing for quite a long time. He said, I owe you quite a lot. <laughs> he's, one of the great, he's one of the greatest guitar riffs ever written. I mean, you know, we yeah. thought they'd all been done and then that came along. John, um, you went out on a high pretty much, but a bit too early for you, I would imagine. I mean, you know, for, for to, every album just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, you end up doing 13 nights at Wembley Arena you go 21 nights at the Sydney Entertainment Centre. I mean, records everywhere. And then, you know, Brothers in Arms is the biggest selling record in the UK uh, of the entire decade. Um, but then Mark doesn't want to do it anymore. How, how did that feel for you? Well, I, to, the feeling was mutual. I mean, to, to be honest, I was very surprised when we ended up doing On Every Street because I thought that after Brothers in Arms, that was probably enough. And, you know, when you when you have an album like that, which sort of suddenly does things that you don't expect it to do and becomes very successful, you think, OK, well, how, how are we going to sort of... You don't think how are we going to top that, but it, it's quite difficult to follow something like that. And Mark and I were just having lunch one day in, in London I think in 1990 or maybe 90, I can't remember exactly. And, and he said, I've got some songs uh, that I think the, the Straits should do. And I went, really? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought we were kind of like, I thought we sort of have a, had a mutual agreement that we probably just, you know. Anyway, uh, so we ended up going to the studio again, which, and I loved doing that record. It took a long time, but I loved doing it. And I, you know, I've got a lot of, a big soft spot for On Every Street. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a nice album. It, it was, um, but unfortunately, it's one of those impossible things, isn't it? Where, where no matter how relaxed and low key it is for you, yeah. coming, it's the expectation is just you know, Lord, you know, heat it felt like it, another it? decade had, uh, and things had changed. Yes, well, we're in the nineties now, mm -hmm. so I mean, it came out in nineteen ninety, ninety one, nineteen ninety one, and so that was that's six years after Brothers. That's quite a long time. 
but you know, I'd 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 re I'd recorded my second album by then, and Mark had done goodness knows what. Uh, too much to list right now, but but the on every street tour was was literally for me was the was the was the time to uh, call it a day. I mean, I was emotionally, physically, psychologically, completely and utterly drained, as everybody was. I for one, need, I I for one needed to get away from it completely. I mean, I really did. And and I I could see Mark's writing was changing, uh, with with on every street, and I think that you know it, it was a it was a mutual decision, mm -hmm. um, and and well, that's nice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The fullness of time. That's it's really yeah. You know, bands are like politicians; they never. And end Mark well. always plays oh, on so you Mark did. plays on your <laughs> solo stuff all the time as well, doesn't he? Yeah, from time to time he does. You know, I don't I don't really want to sort of use him as a calling card, but I, you know, obviously if, if he's free and. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's nice to have him involved. Um, and but, getting back um, together must have been on your mind occasionally. I mean, just not for the money. Obviously, you guys don't need that, but just the, you know, the thrill of it. Well, it's like it's like if you try and repeat what you've done before, I think it would be quite difficult because I think the levels of energy that we've all got would be are very different. You could sell out Wembley Stadium tomorrow. You know that. But yeah, okay, yeah, that would be that would be great. But uh, and then what do you do with that? You know, I know, I know. It's a bit like yeah. I don't know how many um, uh, you know final tours some people have done, but I mean, I, I, they seem to <laughs> some people do final tours every couple of years, which is quite interesting. But I'm I'm very happy doing what I'm doing mm. right now. You know, um, I've enjoyed writing this book. I've enjoyed you know I got my eighth. So well, you've always been quite prolific, haven't you, John? In terms of your own records, yeah. you know, you always. Kept your hand. Well, number eight is coming out just after Christmas. So, uh, well, congratulations, yeah. which you've recorded at uh, at Mark's studio. I, he, I did the. I did the. Well, you usually I do, did, don't I, you? I which did the mixing one? there, actually. Oh right, right. Which is a beautiful oh. studio. Because I remember seeing videos of you doing something there, which is yeah, which is now the studio. It's like it's the, only the only studio one left. It's the one studio that everyone wants to work British. in. And there's that lovely thing, isn't it? If, because it's not a commercial venture, because it's Mark's studio. It's just the but British Grove. Is that a British, British Grove? Right? Yeah, yeah. British I think Grove. he'd quite like it to be commercial-ish. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and and we should mention your painting. You, this is what you've you, you do. Yes. You've had exhibitions all over the world, haven't you? I have. Yeah, I I love painting. To me, it's another form of communication, a, a, a different form of communication. And uh, I, I, you know, yes, I, I really, really, really enjoy it. And I've got a studio here in the garden, which where I go is my refuge. There is a piano in there and a couple of guitars as well, just in case I don't want to paint that day. But yeah, I, I paint when I'm not when I'm not making music. I'm painting really. Good luck with yeah, with the yeah. book, uh, My Life in Dire Straits. Was it out on Bantam or something? Is it Bantam? Well, it's. I think it's. I think they're the people who sort of do something with it, but it's Penguin Trans World. Ah. Really, is oh, that sounds good. Um, well, yeah. uh, lovely humble man. Lovely, lovely humble man. Terrible. We had to really speed up towards the end there. There's, there's just always, always so much more than you. I know, think, I know. And then it? we get the sign, don't we, from the producer saying, you know, you better speed it up there, guys. But no, I think you know, we 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 we'd, we'd kept him a long time, and he. But uh, yeah, we did keep a long time. But what a charming, delightful man, erudite. And yeah, and it's nice to know. You know, actually, do you know what the truth is, guy? You're in my top five. Actually, you might even be in my top two because I've got to include my brother in there. <laughs> uh, play your cards right, son. <laughs> no, I try. All right. Well, um, that was brilliant. Um, we hope you enjoy that as much as yeah. we did. And we'll be back yeah. next week with uh, someone equally. That's wonderful. Good. And uh, it's good night from me. And it's good night from them. Mm -hmm.